Mr Chairman, my dear friends, what we're going to look at tonight is indeed a very interesting subject because back in 1947 some discoveries were made down in the area of the Dead Sea of these scrolls that were manuscripts, copies of the Bible. There were some 972 approximately scrolls found in these caves down by the Dead Sea. And an examination of these scrolls has found that many of them were copies of the Old Testament books of the Bible. In actual fact, every Old Testament book has at least one scroll except the book of Esther. And what we're going to do this evening is we're going to concentrate our attention on really just one of those books. And the reason we're going to do it is because that particular book we have ready access to via the internet. We have ready access to, we can go and actually look at that scroll, actually look close up at that scroll, take the Hebrew, translate it into the English, and it does it all for you, and we know what in actual fact that scroll actually says. So we can then compare it with the Bible we've got in our laps, see how much it's changed, show you that it really hasn't, and that the message of the Bible has been the same for more than 2,000 years. And then we're going to get down those words that were in these caves. While they were in the caves, the words were being fulfilled. God's proved right. We're going to see that the Bible is accurate. So we're just going to begin with by having a little bit of a look where we're going. We're going down to the lowest point on the earth, almost. Down to the shores of the Dead Sea. And there down on the shores of the Dead Sea, as we said in about 1947, this Bedouin was looking up and goes. And he came across this spot up here, this particular cave here, cave number one. They're numbered in the order in which scrolls were found in them. Something I didn't know till I did a little bit more research. And so he was, he was looking after his goats. Don't ask me what they were eating because if you look there, there's very much nothing there to eat. But he was looking after them there and he'd lost them. So he threw a stone into one of these caves and heard pottery smash. So he went in and had a look. And from there the story goes on. You see, these scrolls had been in these caves for 2,000 years. They were copies of the Bible that were 2,300 years old. The oldest Bibles ever found. As we said, copies of every book of the Old Testament except Esther have been found. Some of the copies, some of the, of the books, so-called books of the Bible, are in actual fact better, could be better described as paraphrases or commentaries. But when we have a look at the Isaiah scroll, the, or one of the 22 Isaiah scrolls, we'll see that in actual fact it's extremely accurate. And this one here is probably the most famous of the caves. There it is there, a little keyhole shape. Um, it's cave number four and it's the location of the most significant finds and probably if you've been to the land of Israel, that's the place they'll take you to. All right. Well, that's cave number four. That was the fourth cave in which scrolls were found, but it has had a a numerous amount of of scrolls found in there and extremely significant. As we said, there was a Bedouin in 1947 and he he found, the because his goats got lost, he threw a stone up into a little hole there. Okay. In actual fact, the hole was a lot smaller than that then, as we'll see in a moment. All right. It was a lot smaller than that then. And he threw this stone in there, must have been a pretty good shot, and pottery smash. So he went in to have a look. All right? Now in actual fact, this particular website that I got this from, the, the chap on the site said he went back three times to find that cave. Went past, back, forth, back, forth, went home. Came out again. Passed, back, forth, back, forth, went home. Third time, he found it. Not easy to find, even, not even though they made the hole a lot bigger. All right? And here's the same spot. Okay? You can see a big rock in front of it. And if you get it at the wrong angle, you can't actually see it. All right? So, in this particular cave, we've found seven scrolls, including two copies of Isaiah. Two copies of the book of Isaiah. And the original cave, here it is. There, it's got a, quite a big hole. Well, it's actually got two holes. One that goes round like that. It was actually excavated later on. And there's one up here. 
Okay? And it's not a very easy place to get to. In actual fact, the, um, the tourist companies tell you, don't try to climb up there. It's too dangerous. That's what they tell you. Don't try and do it. It's too hard to get there. So that just gives us a bit of a, bit of a background, a bit of an idea what this is all about. Okay, now these particular K, these particular scrolls, he found seven scrolls. He sold four of them to a Syrian religion, a Syrian church of some sort, who then um, later on they turned up in a newspaper for sale, trying to get rid of them in 1954 in the US. The other three were sold in November the 29th, 1947, November the 29th, 1947, they were sold to a Jew. They passed in the hands of the Jews for the first time in 2,000 years on the 29th of November 1947. As you'll see later, that is a significant date in history. So, just a little bit more information about these particular scrolls. Some manuscripts were written, some of these manuscripts that they found were written, and copied in the 3rd century BC. So that's 300 or 2 to 300 years before the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. The bulk of the material, particularly the texts that reflect on a sectarian community, it was probably it was believed that this community was the Essenes who lived down in this area of Qumran, um, down by the Dead Sea and they, they were very fanatical in their religion and... Um, and they, the, many of the texts reflect their beliefs and they were in strong opposition to the people who were living in, to, to the Jews that were living in Jerusalem. So they not only had copies of the Bible, they had sacred texts where they had interpreted the Bible, where they had... So these, these, passi- these, uh, these other scrolls, while they have um, their own writings, they also quote the Bible and that's very, very... Um, useful for us because it can show us that in actual fact these words when they're quoted were exactly what we have in our Bibles today. So while well, they're not important from the point of view of understanding the word of God, they show us the accuracy of it. Okay? And these date to about the first century BC and some of them were written not long before they were finally put in the cave and the Romans came in in AD 68 and wiped them out. And this particular community was wiped out in AD 68. And many of the Isaiah scrolls, there are 22 scrolls of Isaiah. 22 copies or parts thereof. Okay? Um, and some of them date to, in, in, in the range of 2 to 300 BC. So they were a couple of hundred years old when they were put in that cave already. And so what those scrolls say the prophecies they give were fulfilled, many of them, while they were in those caves. And we're going to have a look at some of those things. Or they were actually fulfilled just as they were being found. You see, what we're finding is that the Dead Sea Scrolls were written and placed in these caves before Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. It's before they were destroyed by the Romans. We know that because we know this community down in Qumran was destroyed by the Romans before Jerusalem was destroyed in AD 70, at least two years before. And so they were put in those caves before the Jews were scattered amongst the nations. They were put in those caves 2,000 years before Israel was reborn as a nation in 1948. And some of those scrolls are copies of the Bible that contains these very prophecies. Particularly, we're going to have a look at how these things are spoken of in the book of Isaiah because we have ready access to that particular book. Now what we could also do is we could go down to the bottom of the Dead Sea, we'd go to a place called Masada, And what we're going to do with Isaiah, we could do exactly the same with Ezekiel 36 to 38. Because in the excavations down in Masada, about the only scriptures that were found was a little portion of a scroll from Ezekiel 36 to 38, a prophecy that the Jews would return to the land. The Bible is being shown to be accurate. God is being shown to be right, that his prophecies are right. 
So what we're going to do is just examine the textural accuracy of these books, of this particular. We're going to look particularly as the one we have access to and that is the Isaiah scroll. Now there is, at the top, all of the Isaiah scroll. All right? It's pretty large. All right? I can't remember exactly how long it is. It's a pretty long scroll. And what they've done is actually taken it into pieces um, so that they can, yeah, well, when they looked at it at, at that particular time. Now, when they, they went and compared that with the Hebrew, the Hebrew of the Isaiah scroll with what is called the Masoretic text, which is the, the, uh, the basic Hebrew from which our Bibles is trans, are translated, they found that throughout this book, of Isaiah, 66 chapters and 1,300 verses, there were 1,396 variants from the Masoretic text to this great Isaiah scroll. You say, boy, that's a lot, that's significant. Well, not really. When you consider that these people are copying, without any, anyone looking over their shoulder, they're copying from one book to another. And over a period over 1,300 verses, they made a mistake approximately once a verse. Now, some of those are so insignificant that, in actual fact, what they regard as a variant is where someone corrected themselves. And so, in the first verse, where it talks about Isaiah who spoke, who, who prophesied in the times of Hezekiah, in the, in the, um, the great Isaiah scroll, There's a small correction. Initially, the the scribe miswrote Hezekiah. So he crossed it out and corrected it above. Now, that's regarded as a variant. So, they're meaningless. So, there are 75 spelling variants. There are 212 grammar or copying variants. In other words, little spots where they've copied it slightly differently. Okay? Okay. in the great Isaiah scroll, there's a little bit out of Isaiah 4 verses 5 to 6 that's missing, but if you compare the other 21 scrolls, it's there. So, insignificant. There are 356 single words that have been added in the, in the Isaiah scroll compared to the, the text that we have. Single words that have been added virtually don't change the meaning. There are 718 single or multiple words, uh, word variants. Now, in other words, there's slight variations which involve a couple of words. Now, that's, you might say, well, that's huge. They're not regarded as making any difference because, for instance, in Isaiah 8 and verse 9, there's a little sentence that's repeated twice in our Bibles. Well, the, Isaiah, the great Isaiah scroll has missed one of them out. There's four... Out of the whole 66 books, there's four full clauses that have been changed. For instance, Isaiah 38 and verse 6, which is actually almost exactly the same as 2 Kings 19 and verse 34, misses out a short part of a sentence. And so there's a slight variation there, but you could get the same meaning from going to 2 Kings chapter 19 and verse 34. Now, there are, the, the, the authorities say that there, of all the book of Isaiah, there is actually only 31 possibly significant variants. Now, the concentration of those is in Isaiah 21. Let's have a look at, at the three concentrations of possibly significant variants. And look, you can, you can work out for yourself if these are significant. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 21. Firstly, we'll have a look at, at verse 1. Now, where I've got MT, that's, what, that's the translation of the Masoretic text. It may not be exactly the same as what you have in front of you because in some cases, what you have in front of you, um, there's a better translation. Um, that, that's why it might be slightly different. Isaiah 21 and verse 1 in the, in, in, in the, the, uh, the Masoretic text, it's, it says the oracle or the burden concerning the wilderness of the sea or the desert of the sea. Our Bible has the burden of the desert of the sea or there's the Masoretic text or pretty much it's the same as the oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea. The text found down in, in Qumran says the oracle of the pasture by the sea. Come down to verse 8. 
in verse 8, and you'll have to look at your margins for this, the Masoretic text has, and he cried as a lion. Well, the great Isaiah scroll says, the lookout shouted. If you cry as a lion, you shout. Come to, uh, come to verse 10. In verse 10, it talks about, um, oh, my threshing and the corn of my floor. Or the idea is um, and winnowed one. So it's, it's one who's been, been threshed and winnowed. And in the, in the, um, the great Isaiah scroll, it says, O oh, my threshed one and child of my stone wall. It's, the sim- it's a similar idea. So insignificant are these changes. And many of the changes are even less significant than that. So what we can see is that really at the end of the day the changes that have been made or the, or the, the differences between this scroll that is 2,000 plus years old and what we have on our lap, there is insignificant difference between the two records. And the chap, one of the chaps who has had a lot to do with these scrolls over the years is a chap by the name, by the name of Yigal Yedin. His father was the man who bought these scrolls off the Arabs on the 29th of November 1947. And this is what he has to say about them. He says, There is no question that the overwhelming significance of the text lies in the fact that these scrolls, which are about a thousand years older than any other Hebrew text hitherto discovered, vary only slightly from the text as it is known to us and used today. It thus proves the antiquity and the authenticity of the Masoretic text, which is the text, the basic text from which we get our Bible today. It's showing us that these things have not changed in 2,000 plus years. The Bible we have is an accurate account of what God gave to Isaiah so many years ago. He goes on to say, in particular, in regard to the Isaiah scroll, the, great, the, the Isaiah scrolls that, that were bought by his father in, uh, in 1947, he says, what is astonishing is that despite their antiquity and the fact that the scrolls belong to this pre-standardisation period, in other words, there was no one really checking what they were doing. So when they copied it out, it wasn't checked. It didn't, wasn't, it didn't have a, uh, a quality assurance um, system to go through. He says, they are on the whole almost identical to the Masoretic text known to us. This establishes a basic principle for all future research on the text of the Bible. Not even the hundreds of slight variations established in the text affecting mainly spelling and occasional word substitution can alter that fact. What we're going to do is we're going to now go and examine this Isaiah scroll. And we're going to take certain passages from those scrolls which talk about the Jewish nation, about the nation of Israel. We're going to see that while that scroll was sitting in the cave, its words were being fulfilled. And those things are a testimony to that that God has not lost control, that God knows what is going on with the earth and that his plan and his purpose is being fulfilled as he said because what we're going to see is, is, is right down to the letter. These things are fulfilled. And it gives us confidence that the things which are yet to be fulfilled will indeed take place. And so what you can actually do, there is a website that brings up this. Brings up this scroll here. And you can, uh, you can take this, this little slider down the bottom and slide along and you can look at all 66 books of the... Uh, 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah and it just goes along these scrolls and then what you do is you go up here and you say click here and it will bring up the verse. Alright, now what I've done is a, bit of, uh, is a bit of cut and paste and you probably can't see it, I've clicked twice. Okay, I've um, got two clicks and then I've taken what, what pops up. It actually pops up with a translation, okay, but it only does one verse at a time. To save time I put the two verses up. Alright, so Click here, this is Isaiah 11, verse 11, and this is Isaiah 11, verse 12. Now what you'll notice 
is Hebrew, goes from right to left, doesn't it? Watch it, there it goes, across the page, there it goes, across there, across there, there's the end of the line, there's the end of the sentence, right? So it goes from, from right to left, all right? And that's the way it's written and the scroll goes that way. Chapter 1 is up this end, it's, it's rolled up, chapter 66 is down in the middle there, all right? And that's how it works, all right? So, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 11 and 12, okay? Here's our first text that was in that cave for 2,000 years. What did God, what did he say? It was put in that cave when Israel existed as a nation. They were not scattered amongst the nations, they existed as a nation, as an entity in the land of Israel. What does this, well, this verse tell us? Isaiah 11, verse 11. You can follow it in your Bible and you'll notice that there are a few little things that are a little unusual. In other, for instance, here we have L-R-D. It's Jewish superstition. They don't like to pronounce the name of God. So they put L-R-D in case they might blaspheme. All right? And they're still doing it today. And that's a fulfilment of what Isaiah said about them. We read about it, in actual fact. When they return to the land, they'll, they'll have ears, but their ears won't be able to hear. They'll have eyes, but their eyes won't be able to see. They'll be spiritually deaf and blind. That's the Lord Jesus Christ that's going to change that. And this is part of that spiritual deafness and blindness. And so, when you see that, I'm just going to read over it, hopefully read over it because that's part of their superstition that needs to be changed and will be changed when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth. So let's have a look at what this particular verse, two verses, has to say. And it shall come, now this is exactly as I've got off the website, okay, you can follow it in your Bible, you'll see how much different it is. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people that shall remain from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he will set up an ensign for the nations and will assemble the dispersed of Israel and gather together the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now he says, in that day, it's a future day in the times of Isaiah. It was not something that happened in the time of Isaiah. It's something that's going to happen when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth. And in that day, in that time period, well, he will recover the second time the people. In other words, there's, a, there's going to be, there would have been a time when the children of Israel would have been brought back from the nations before. And that happened. It happened just after the times of of Isaiah. The Babylonians came down in 606 BC. They took the Jewish nation captive. They took them to Babylon and they returned 70 years later. And they were in the land until about AD 70 when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and scattered them amongst the nations. So when this scroll was put in the cave, Israel was not scattered amongst the nations. This verse says they would be. In actual fact, if you examine those places, Assyria is north, Egypt is south, Cush is probably um, east, and you've got areas that are west. So it's the four points of the compass that these, that these people would be brought back from. And who is it? Well, it's the dispersed of Israel and Judah. They would be brought back. And they would be gathered from the four corners of the earth. So, in other words, this prophecy requires that they had to be scattered, an event that took place after the Isaiah scroll was put in that cave. So, we're seeing the Bible being shown to be accurate that firstly the nation of Israel would be scattered amongst the nation, but then they would be brought back. And what we have seen, friends, from 1948, or really even before that, we've seen a partial fulfilment of these things. We've seen these things being shown that God is able to bring a nation that doesn't exist, that it might become a nation again. And these things 
have not been fulfilled yet. The nation of Israel is not brought completely back into the land of Israel. That will be the work of Elijah the prophet, as we're told in, in the book of Malachi, who's going to go forth and bring them back into the land when the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth. So let's have a look at another. Let's come to our reading in Isaiah chapter 43. Because Isaiah chapter 43 talks about the nation of Israel and God says that they are his witnesses that he exists. And what better way to prove that God exists than to take a copy of this book, put it in a cave and let no man touch it for 2,000 years. And at the end of that 2,000 years, bring it out and let them read it and see that what he said over 2,000 years ago is coming to pass. See, and that's exactly what God did. So this little section here, this is Isaiah 43 verse 1, begins there, finishes about there. Alright, goes down here and down there. Alright, that's Isaiah 43. What we're going to do is we're going to take these words and we're going to have a look and examine what, compare them with what, you can compare them as you read along with what the Bible, what your, your um, Bible that you've got in front of you says and see how different they are. And, um, and, and, you can, uh, and, and we can see what the message is that is in these words for us to consider. Isaiah 43 and at verse 1. Now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Now you might have noticed that in the beginning of verse 1, you have this word Hashem. You see, it means the name. Shem means name. Ha, I think, means the. Yes, I'm right. Hashem means the name. And that's how the Jews actually translate the name of God, the four letters of the Tetragrammaton, H, uh, w, uh, Y, H, W, H. They translate it as Hashem because they don't want to, to take the name of Almighty God in vain. So they will not use the divine name. In, and in doing so, they don't come to understand fully the divine purpose. You see, that name means He who will be. It shows that God will be manifested or shown forth in a multitude of people whom he will create and whom he will shape according to his purpose. He shapes us by applying pressure in our life to shape us to the type of character that he wants to develop in us. That's how he works. And this is what he's saying I'm going to do with, he's going to do with the nation of Israel. You see, he's going to create them and form them. Okay? He created them back in the times of Moses and the times of of Abraham. He brought this nation into being. He created them. And over a period of time he is forming them. He's moulding them to develop them into a people who will give him honour and glory. And that's where we're going to end up tonight. With that nation giving God honour and glory as the greatest nation upon the face of the earth as far as that is concerned. So God says, he says concerning them, when thou passest through the waters, now waters, Isaiah 57 and verse 20, speaks of the wicked. It's told, the wicked are as a troubled sea. The book of Revelation talks about the waters and they're a symbol of the the wicked or the nations. So when they pass through the nations, as they were scattered amongst the nations, God will be with them. You know what many of the people of the world say is that God has rejected them, that God's cast them off forever. He's not interested in them. Well, that's not what God says. I will be with thee. Who's he talking to? Jacob, Israel. The natural descendants of Jacob. When you pass through the rivers, they'll not overflow thee. Rivers are overflowing powers, are nations who who would invade the land of Israel. It's used of Assyria who would overflow the nation of Israel to the neck. That's what we're told in Isaiah 8 and verse 7. So rivers are a symbol of nations who would come and invade the land of Israel. 
He says, when they won't be able to overflow you. You'll still exist after they've been and gone. You know, that's interesting because Isaiah 8 and verse 7 talks about the Assyrian, not Syrian, the Assyrian who would overflow to the neck of the, of the, 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 the nation of Judah. Do you know an Assyrian? I don't. The Assyrians no longer exist. Israel does. That's what God said. You see? And he says, goes on, thou shalt not be burned. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the fire kindle upon thee. So thou would not be completely destroyed by the fire. And when the Romans came down, the Bible talks about the Roman invasion, the Roman destruction of the nation of Israel as a fire. And a fire which would destroy the very fabric of that nation would mean that they could no longer keep the law, the temple was destroyed and so forth. But guess what? The people would not be able to be completely destroyed. They would continue as an entity. Those things, friends, were able to be proved wrong for 2,000 years and could not be. They sat in that cave, those words, as a testimony, as a proof that what God says is right. And if they were wrong, we did, people would dig them up. They were, as they dug it up in 1947, they'd be, they'd be pointing to it every day and saying, see, God's wrong. You know why the world doesn't want to know about these things? Because it proves that God's right. Let's move down to verse 3. God says, he says, For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Saviour. I'm not here to destroy you, I'm going to save you. You're going to pass through the fire. You're going to pass through all these judgments that are going to take place upon you. You know, we could go to another copy of the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, and you could read a, a, a very, very intricate account of what would happen to them. Down through history, you could read about the Babylonian invasion, the Roman invasion, a nation whose tongue you would not understand. It would come from the other end of the known world at that time. It would come and destroy them. He says... I'm not actually here to destroy, I'm here to save you. And I'm going to, in the end, make of you a great people. That's what he's saying. He says, I have given Egypt for thy ransom and Ethiopia and Seba for thee. And God's talking about the time when he will bring them back into the land of Israel. And in order to bring them back into the land of Israel, he would give a ransom. He would give a price for their life that they might be reborn as a nation. And it, Isaiah chapter 60 talks about the fact that Tarshish, which is an ancient name for Britain, who would be the first country to bring the Jewish people back into the land of Israel. That's what happened. History actually tells us that's what happened in the 1940s. And so God would give that nation a ransom as in a price for his nation of Israel. And the ransom would be Egypt, Ethiopia and Seba. Now Egypt, we know Egypt, that was given to the nation of of Britain. Britain controlled it from 1881 to 1956. And in the middle of it, the nation of Israel was born with the help of the British. The other ransom God promised was Ethiopia. Now, Ethiopia in Hebrew is Cush. If you look at it in Hebrew, that's what it says, Cush. Now, Cush is actually the area today of Iraq. All right? Well, Cush, the Cushites actually, actually migrated over a period of time. The Cushites migrated from the area of Iraq down into, uh, into northern Africa and we see them there today in the Ethiopians of today. But... Cush here was under the control of Britain from 1920 to 1958. They were given as a ransom. Seba or Sudan, once again, given as a ransom from about 1898 to 1956. And Britain controlled these countries. They were God, what God gave to the nation, the British, and saying, here is the price for restoring, for assisting with the restoring of the nation of Israel to life. Here is this price. While these things happened, the Dead Sea Scrolls, a testimony to those things, were in that cave. 
And so Britain became the first to assist the Jews to return to the Holy Land after 2,000 years of dispersion. And then God says in verse 4, Since thou art precious in my sight and honourable, I have loved thee, therefore I will give men for thee and peoples for thy life. What he's saying is those who oppose God's purpose with Israel, they'll pay with it, pay for it with their life. And you know, friends, a classic example is World War I. In World War I, God determined, and this is what World War I was all about, It was all about pushing the Turkish nation that was ruling in the land of Israel out of the land of Israel so that he could free up that land for the the Jews to return there. Now, Australia didn't know that. But do you know something? In the British Parliament, those exact things were debated. In the British Parliament, those exact things were debated. Now, you know, what actually happened was Australians went to Anzac Cove and didn't get off the beach. They didn't get off the beach. In actual fact, it was a failure before they landed on the shore. Eventually, they learned their lesson, backed off, went down into Egypt and pushed the Turks out. You see, when Australia opposed God, men of Australia were given for them. They lost their lives because they opposed God. When they did what God said, they had major victories all the way up through the Sinai to push the Turks out of the land and it freed the land for the nation of Israel to, to be regathered and to the nation, the nation of Israel to be reformed as a nation, nation as it was in 1948. And so God says, he says, all right, I'll give you this ransom, I'll give people's lives for thee and that's going to be preparation for this. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed, who's it the seed? Verse 1, Jacob and Israel. I will bring thy seed from the east, gather them from the west, from the north and from the south. Bring them from the ends of the earth, bring them back into the land of Israel. All these things were in that cave as a testimony. And they dug them up, brought them out and after it all happened, oh, it was prophesied. It was clearly prophesied. The word of God was shown to be right. You can have a look at Isaiah 58 in your own time. It basically says that God, although God was angry with them for a while, he will, be, uh, will have everlasting mercy upon them. We don't have time to go there. Coming down to verse 7 and 8. He says, Everyone that is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him, yea, I have made him. He says, here's what I'm going to do with these people. He says, I've created them for my glory. God has a purpose with these people. We could go to Isaiah 29 verses 22 to 24 and it talks about how that Jacob, when he sees his descendants, they won't be a stiff-necked people. They'll be a people that are not no longer blind but a people who can see. But he says, concerning these people, that when they come into that land, they will be a blind people that have eyes, a deaf people that have ears. In other words, that forming, that shaping of the nation of Israel, that moulding of the nation of Israel, so that they might be completely conformed to what God wants to do with them, that they might give him honour and glory, is not complete. In actual fact, in real terms, it's got a long way to go. And what we're being told is when that nation's brought, when the Jews are brought out of the nations from the north, the south, the east and the west, they'll be brought back spiritually blind and deaf. Those things are actually quoted again in Isaiah. Let's come back to Isaiah chapter 6 because Isaiah chapter 6 says how long that blindness would continue for. Once again, we have these things on the Isaiah scroll. Isaiah chapter 6. Let's have a look at verse 10. It says this, Make the hearts, talking about the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, he says, Make the hearts of this people fat, make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and, and convert and be healed. You see, these things, God's saying, this is what this nation is going to be like. 
They're going to have eyes that see not. They're going to have ears that hear not. And those things were fulfilled in the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these, these, this particular verse is one of the most, most quoted verses in the New Testament. The New Testament quotes it in Matthew chapter 13, verse 14, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12, Luke chapter 8, verse 10, John chapter 12, verse 40, Acts chapter 28, verse 26 to 27, saying that the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, are blind and deaf to the things of God. They're blind and deaf. And Isaiah the prophet, in reply to God, he says in in, uh, in verse 11, he says, Then said I, Lord, how long? In other words, how long is this going to be? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without an inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord hath removed men far away, and there be a a great forsaking in the midst of the land. You know, when this scroll was put in the cave... None of that had happened. None of that had happened. In actual fact, when this event here happened, Acts 26, Acts 28, verses 26 to 27, when the Apostle Paul was in Rome, AD early 60s, that's about when those scrolls were read the last time before they were put in the cave. And those things, and this verse here was being fulfilled as this scroll was being put in the cave. And then, the, and then all these things happened while the scroll, the great Isaiah scroll, was in the cave. And he says, and God says, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove them far away from this land. And that's what happened. AD 70 came, and the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem. The nation was scattered. The Jews were scattered amongst the nations. And if they'd been Assyrians, they'd have ceased to exist as a nation. If they'd been Moabites, they'd have ceased to exist as a nation. Ammonites, Isaiah talks about all these, Moabites, Ammonites, Assyrians. He talks about Babylonians. He talks about um, um, Edomites. And none of them exist today. They're all the nations around the nation of Israel. None of them exist. But God says... I'll remove you far from the land of Israel. I'll make your land desolate. You know, in fact, one stage, Jerusalem was sowed with salt. You know what you do if you want nothing to grow there? You sow it with salt. That's what happened to this nation. And that's what happened to the land of Israel. And in the end, God said, well, I'm going to... This nation, because they shut their eyes and they put their fingers in their ears, they're refusing to see, they're refusing to listen, I'll scatter them amongst the nation and while they're scattered, they're going to be blind. It's going to be, they're going to be blind until all these things have taken place. And he says this, and the, Lord, and the Lord have removed thee far away and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land, but yet in it shall be a tenth. And that's the idea of a remnant. And what's going to happen, what it's talking about is a remnant who are going to return. In it shall be a a remnant who will return. And once they've returned, New International Version has, still again be laid waste. So this little group, this portion of the nation of Israel would return to the land and then still be laid waste again. But after that, there would be a there would be a people who would come, who are called the holy seed, who will be like a teal tree, a teal tree, a tree of strength, as the word means, or as an oak tree, a tree of strength, and they will provide substance that the nation of Israel might be able to see and hear again. And that's the idea of that last verse. So what it's basically saying is that this nation would be scattered amongst the the nations, they would return, a small portion of them would return, as happened in 1948, but then after they'd returned, they would still again be laid waste. And we can read about that. It's yet future. It hasn't happened yet. It's going to happen. It's it's actually spoken of in Ezekiel chapter 38. The Russians, with a group of nations, are going to come down upon upon the land of Israel... And they're going to lay that nation waste again for the last time. And it's after that that the holy seed will provide substance and strength for that people. 
and then they'll be able to see. And so what we saw, when we saw in, in Isaiah chapter 43, that they would be blind and they would be deaf when they, can't hear, when, when they return to the land, that's exactly what's happened. Isaiah's prophecies have been fulfilled. And so we go on. Well, what we're going to see in a moment is that, that how, is how that, blind, that blindness and that deafness is going to be healed. We're going to see that in Isaiah 59. Let's come, down to, let's come back to Isaiah 43. Let's have a look at that last section that we read in our reading. God says this. He says, All the nations are gathered together and the peoples and the peoples are assembled. Who among them can declare this? So you gather together all the nations. Who can declare this and announce to us former things? Let them bring their witnesses that they may be justified and let them hear and say it is truth. So let them all bring the witnesses to the truth. And God says concerning the nation of Israel, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and beside me there is no Saviour. I have declared, and I have saved, and I have announced, there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and I am God. What he's saying is, this nation of Israel are the witnesses that God exists. The continued existence of the nation of Israel proves God to be right. Proves that God exists and that his purpose is on track. And what we've seen is that the nation of Israel was scattered amongst the nations, exactly as Isaiah said, They've been brought back to be formed as a nation, as a small part of, that, of the, the Jewish population. As it is today, the Jews in the land of Israel is only a small part of the, the total number of Jews in the world. They would do so blind and deaf to the things of Almighty God in rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ, as they still do today. God, therefore, is shown to exist, to be right, And that his plan and his purpose is indeed on track. And that's what these verses are telling us. And all those things came to pass, friends, while this book, this little scroll, was in that cave. As a testimony to us that God, what he says will occur, does occur. And it occurs exactly as God said. But what's going to happen, friends? Well, this is what's going to happen. Isaiah 59. Once again, the Isaiah scroll says these things. This is what's going to happen. We've, we've seen what's happened. Now we need to believe what it says is going to happen. Well, it says this. That a redeemer will come to Zion unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob. The Lord Jesus Christ is the redeemer. He's going to come to Zion or to Jerusalem to those who change from their blindness and their deafness. Those who are prepared to be changed. And this is what God's going to do with those people. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth nor out of the mouth of thy seed nor out of the mouth of thy seed's seed, saith the Lord from henceforth and forever. So they're no longer going to be blind. They're no longer going to be deaf. They're going to worship God in spirit and in truth. And it's going to happen when the Redeemer comes to Zion to do that. What had to happen for the Redeemer to come to Zion to bring that to pass? Well, the Jews had to be gathered out of the nations where they had been scattered and brought back into the land for those things to occur. We've seen that. That's recent history. That's recent history in fulfilment of the words of the prophet Isaiah. And the result is going to be that that nation of Israel is in that day going to be the preeminent preeminent example amongst the mortals of the nations of how to worship and to serve God. 
So let's just briefly have a look at a timeline of the events that we have considered tonight. This book that we've looked at mostly is, is the book of Isaiah. He prophesied from the year 740 to 680 BC, 2,600 plus years ago. That's when these words were first written. In BC 125 is the approximate date that the great Isaiah scroll was written. That's when it's been dated by the people who dated it. That's the scroll from which we've got the words that we've read tonight. There's other copies that are about that date. Some of them are a little bit older. The great Isaiah scroll was placed in the cave and hid from the Romans. All the prophecies we have considered in that scroll were there. In that scroll, they were there. And those things were put there at the latest in AD 68. That was the time when the Qumran community, as I said it was probably the Essenes, were destroyed by the Romans. In AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed and the city was made desolate, as Isaiah said it would. Isaiah chapter 6, he said it would be the case. The Jews were scattered amongst the nations, just as Isaiah said it would. The scrolls remained in the caves until found by a shepherd boy in early 1947. And then on the 29th of November 1947, two things happened. The United Nations voted to partition the land of Palestine to form a homeland for the Jews. Isaiah had said that that's where they would return to. You know, they, they talked about sending them to northern Australia. They talked about sending them to Uganda, but that's where the vote went. That's where they decided to put them, in the land of Israel, because that's what the prophecies of Almighty God had said. And there's the partition that they set out. That's the map that was was actually put with the United Nations Resolution 181, which um, which was voted upon on that particular day. You know something very interesting? If the vote had taken place the day before, it would not have succeeded. If it had taken place the day after, all indications are that it would not have succeeded. That's an incredible event, friends. That's because God determines something's going to happen. It doesn't matter what public opinion is, it happens. What else happened on that day? Well, that's the day when an Arab and a Jew stood either side of a barbed wire fence in, in, in Jerusalem and passed a scroll across. That scroll was the Isaiah scroll. It was passed into Jewish hands. It was bought by the Jews. So what we've seen is that on that day, two things happened. But then following that, the real event that Isaiah spoke about on the 14th of May 1948, Israel became a nation again, as Isaiah said they would. There will be that little group of people, that little portion of the Jewish people who will be formed again in that homeland. We've seen those things happen according to the prophecies of Isaiah. The future events that we've looked at, that Israel will be defeated by Russia, they will be again laid desolate as Isaiah 6 says. These things will occur. We don't have time to look at that in Ezekiel chapter 38 and Zechariah chapter 14. But we've also seen how the Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth and with his immortal saints will heal that nation will make them the head of the nations. These are incredible events which have taken place. They're not events that would have happened naturally. What we need to do is to come to accept that the word of God is indeed the word of God. In those pages is the hope for every one of us that we might inherit the earth forever. We owe it to ourselves, friends, to look into this Bible, to examine its pages and come to understand what God requires of us that we might have salvation, that we might be with the Lord Jesus Christ when he goes to heal that nation of Israel, when he goes to change them from a people who are blind and deaf to a people who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Friends, we thank you for your time.